Hello and welcome to 18 WJTS Inform. I'm Bill Potter, your host, and joining us in the studio as he does every Friday during legislation, that is State Senator Mark Mesmer. Senator, welcome to the Great. show. Thanks. Great to be here as always. Well, before we get started about two topics we're going to talk mm -hmm. about today, the um, legislation this year is a short session, mm -hmm. which means what? Well, it means we have to work really fast. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, typically, I mean, I, I had twice as many bills assigned to my committee as I could get done, so you have to you have to really whittle down to what you think are the key things that you know you as a chairman and us as a as a group as a whole want to get done because you just don't have time to necessarily deal with everything you know but you know one of the things we identified as a you know key issue this year was helping combat the opioid epidemic and and one of the issues we talked about you know one of the prior weeks was the inspect uh, implementation requiring all doctors to you know to to use that registration or that, that, that online tells you instantly, you know, if somebody's taken a opioid prescription out with another doctor, tracks those, you know, those point of sale uh, contacts immediately. And, and people say, well, you know, will that really work? Yeah, will, will that work? Okay. Uh, and, and so you've got some, I guess not necessarily proof that it'll work, but some, some certainly some uh, support that yeah. it will work. Yeah, and, so and this has to do with the bill two years ago. Yeah, two years ago, we, we were dealing with a bill that uh, Representative Smaltz had authored and, and R Senator Randy Head was working on on our side of the building. And they were trying to get it whittled down to where, I mean, we still have, you know, the instant uh, point of sale requirement for pseudoephedrine products. You know, there's Sudafed or there's, you know, generic, you know, brand other okay. off-brand names of that <clears throat> but we we were at we already required that everybody you know when you buy it they check your driver's license they check how much you've bought and, and it you know instantaneous tracking but even at the two boxes you know with a 96 count per month and up to 16 boxes per year <clears throat> there was still a, a high volume of of that being you know bought for 15 bucks in the store and then walk out to the you know, to the parking lot and sell it to somebody for 25 or 50. I mean, you know, so that was happening. They would, they would have, you know, buyers just go in and, and buy it for them, you know, up to their legal amount. Um, so two years ago, we passed a law that, that was really a copy off of what they had done in Arkansas a couple years before to where a, a pharmacist can stop the sale. If, if you don't have a relationship with that pharmacist, you can only get 24 tablets instead of 96. And, and, you know, I mean, to really try to dampen down the access to just that quick retail sale, you know, uh, um, transaction. It worked tremendously in Arkansas. We had done it in one county the year before. And, and now we've, two years into this, we've, we've seen the same dramatic results, you know, drop in, in, you know, the amount of meth lab uh, busts that we've had in our state as I saw in Arkansas, and, and we had in, in one county that had done it for a year prior to this bill. So in 2015, Indiana, unfortunately, led, led the state in, in meth lab seizures. We had uh, 1,452 meth lab seizures that year. Uh, in 2016, it dropped to 943, and, and in 2017, it dropped to 371. That's a 75% decrease wow. in, in the amount of meth lab seizures. And children that are in homes that were, you know, involved with a meth lab seizure dropped by 83%. So you're, you're dealing, and have we necessarily reduced, you know, through that law change, we may probably haven't necessarily dropped the demand for methamphetamine products, you know, in the, on the black market. But one of the big, you know, I call it, you know, one of the big scabs of dealing with that was cars that were contaminated, you know, with meth labs in the cars, homes that were contaminated when people were trying to sell a home and had, you know, maybe they had a meth lab in the home, you know, fires, you know, due to meth lab things that went wrong. Uh, just a lot of, a lot of symptoms that were, that, that were problematic, you know, with, with the amount of meth labs that we had, you know, in our, in our, within our state boundaries. So we've had a huge impact on that by tightening up access and allowing, you know, point of sale, you know, uh, limitations by the pharmacist. It worked in Arkansas. It, I think it was up around, oh, the Muncie area. There was a county that had tried it for a year. They saw the same dramatic drop and statewide we've seen the same dramatic drop. So it uh, gives us a lot of confidence that tightening up the inspect 
uh, and you know for you know for the uh, controlled substance prescriptions is going to have the you know going to have the same net effect on dropping you know how, how much uh, how much of the opioid product gets in the black market. I'd imagine fighting meth is like a, a dam with a whole bunch of holes. It, it, and for, it, it, for police and prosecutors, you've now filled the hole yeah. so they can focus on other holes that are, yeah. maybe that's where it's coming in or how it's being distributed. Yeah. So. so, you know, along with the inspect, you know, we've got, we've got to mm -hmm. tighten up supply. We've got to offer better treatment programs, you know, to folks and we've got to, and, and for people who are dealing, you know, in the, in the heroin or the black market, you know, opioids, we've got to give law enforcement, you know, all the tools they need to, you know, to go after the people that are, selling it illegally, treat the people that are hooked, and, and then try to tighten up, you know, the supply, you know, on the retail side. So all of those working together, it's going to take, it's all of them to really start. We've got to stop getting, letting the problem get worse, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and the, you know, these are things that should at least, you know, start limiting the, the growth of the problem. And it's a, it's a nationwide problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, so is, you know, so was the pseudoephedrine meth, you know, issues. I mean, it's a, it's a nationwide problem where, you know, we're trying to do what we can to, you know, to tighten down on things and, and you know, make things better for our state. So. Well, unfortunately, easy access mm -hmm. creates problems. And, and not that it's easy, but there's this doctor shopping. Mm -hmm. So you can go from one doctor to another. If you're, if you're somebody that needs the opioids for the wrong reason. Right. Uh, we we, we want to make it, there are people who have legitimate chronic pain needs They've never been, you know, the problem of, of, of that product getting out on, on the market, black market. But, um, and, and one thing that was surprising to me, you know, two years ago when we put this law into effect to really, you know, tighten up, you know, access to the pseudoephedrine, the biggest fight we had and, and, the, and the people who were, who were there representing, you know, the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture the product were our biggest obstacle to getting you know, to getting a, a bill put together at the end, they kept, you know, I guess planting seeds of confusion into, you know, into, I mean, they, they try to get everybody, you know, unsure that it was the right thing to do. And, and you know, but ultimately they have a, a motive of, you know, tighter demand or tight, tighter, you know, access to the product means less of it's gonna be sold. And, and they, they were more driven by wanting to maintain their market share than, than necessarily what was, you know, best for the, citizens of our state. Now, there is that opioid problem across mm -hmm. the nation, not just Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but we're seeing it go through Indiana pretty, pretty dear through the legislature really easy. Uh, I mean, we're, it's going through yeah, it, uh, it's, fast. And, it's and been pretty unanimous. Everything so is there not the, the, the argument from? Uh, oh, there's still a big pushback. I mean, there, there is a, you know, I mean, obviously the folks who, who benefit from the sale, mm -hmm. you know, don't like to see, you know, the tightening of access as well. I mean, you know, it, We've had pretty good, at this point, we've been able to, you know, weather any objections and, and uh, yeah, but, but the, the delays that we've had in getting that inspect program rolled out, you know, to every doctor have been due to, due to pushback from the folks that represent the pharmaceutical side of things. But we're going to see that bill go through this yeah, year. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's in the House now, right? We passed that out of the Senate the first half. There could be a companion House bill as well, but, okay. but Senator Houch and authored the you know the senate bill it's passed out of the senate so they'll they'll get it you know starting in a couple weeks on the house side okay. and that'd be one that would come into effect it uh, goes all the way through the governor signs it would come into effect um I, I think the the implementation of that will probably start july 1. okay i don't i don't know that that would be one because you you've got to have you know things that i mean a lot of times you want law, some laws you want to take in you know and it kick in effect immediately some you need to give you know the people that are going to enforce it, you need to give them time to get processes yeah, in place. So. Now, you also want to talk about a bill having to do with workforce development. We, yep, we continue to make good headway uh, on Senator Eckert. He's got a, a really innovative plan to help try to get, you know, workforce development efforts in our state uh, as streamlined as possible. Uh, he's got a bill he's working on. And really, you know, the key that we've identified, and I think everybody that's that's you know, deeply immersed in, in trying to get that policy right. And the House version is, is a little different, but it's heading the same direction. Uh, to get career tech education really implemented, you know, in our schools correctly, uh, right now that, that agency falls under the Commission for Higher Ed, which is your four-year colleges. Okay. And we've had such a, and we've got, 
I mean, I think we've got a lot of the the right pieces in place. You know, there's, you know, there's fe there's federal dollars available for worker retraining. There's, we've got you know, a hundred million dollars more in our you know in our budgets for career tech education at the high schools. You know, we've got all the components. We've got Ivy Tech. We've got VU who offer, you know, a lot. You know, would be able to offer a lot of the, you know, the, you know, those career tech education, you know, programs. Those, you know, the classes. All the, all the pieces are, you know, there, but they're just not working together very well. And right now, Department of Workforce Development, you know, the unemployment office handles. They're handling. their really what their mission is is, is people who have lost a job. You know, making sure they get you know, their un unemployment scenarios, you know, fixed. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of that is trying to get people retrained. Maybe if, if they're, you know, if there's large business closure or their, their job, you know, job in their, in their background doesn't exist anymore, trying to get adult workers retrained. But, so we have all these pieces and parts, you know, some fall under DWD, some fall under the, com under the Commission for Higher Ed. You know, we've, I think the House and Senate leadership have identified we really need to break that career tech education uh, component out as a standalone, you know, and, and the House says we, we want to make it a cabinet level position with, with the governor or, you know, or us just as a separate agency, which would still have the, the head of that department, you know, appointed by the governor, whether it's a cabinet level or a standalone uh, administrative wing, you know, of the governor, breaking that out from Commission for Higher Ed, whose real mission is for your education. Uh, and and we've, we've had a hard time getting the focus and, and the resources and, and, you know, things in place that we need done, you know, because you're always answering to somebody else's, you know, agency that it's not their primary function. So uh, that, that bill passed out of the Education Committee this week, uh, went through tax and fiscal this week, and, and, and is ready to be uh, voted on, on the floor for final passage uh, probably be up for amending on Monday and final vote on Tuesday. But, you know, within that, you know, he's got some pretty creative ideas. We've, we've looked around the country, what's working. Tennessee's got a great model of, of developing one-year uh, CTE programs for, you know, for college-level kids that lets them get through, get, you know, and, and makes them Pell Grant eligible because of the way we set them up and the way we structure them. So rather than have a kid, you know, go to Ivy Tech, you know, they're told you got to go to two years or four years of, of, of classes and, and cover a wide range of stuff. They'll, they'll, they'll maybe go in and get their advanced certifications that they want, pick and choose a few classes, drop out of school. Well, then we tag Ivy Tech with a black mark that says you had a, you had a person who didn't complete a degree. Well, they completed what they wanted mm -hmm. in their degree. Mm -hmm. you know, but if we force them into programs that are, that are two years or four years and and, and they rack up a lot of student debt. You know, the, the Tennessee program that we're copying on that model gets these, uh, we, can, we can allocate a portion of our uh, 21st century scholar and, and O'Bannon, you know, uh, grants that we already have, federal Pell grants become in, in play, get students, and they have an 85% placement rate with people that come through that program in, their, in, that, in that Tennessee's model, and they deal with about 25,000 students a year incredibly successful and, and and that's kind of the direction you know we're going to go with with some of our um, CTE efforts you know for, for kids coming out of high school give them a one-year option they get out of there with what they need advanced certifications no debt and and ready to hit the workforce and that's going to be going that'll be presented we'll, on the floor yep next year next, next week, week. Yep. Okay. and then and that's so there's a companion bill on the house side that uh, Senator or representative Houston is working on has a lot of the same components in it. Obviously, by the end of session, you know those two bills will merge into into you know the final policy. But but both of them have got us headed this you know the, the same general direction, which is slight new, different nuances on how they're approaching it. Okay, so and the session ends March March fourteenth. Fourteenth. So mm -hmm. we're about uh, close to four, four and a half weeks. Yep. Okay. Yep. So Tuesday will be the official you know that'll be the end of our of our Senate bill and House bill activity on you know bills from their House of Origin. And the following Monday, will the bill switch chambers, and it'll be three more weeks of, of committee work and a week of conference committees, and right. busy, busy. 
Well, thank you very much, Senator, You're for welcome. coming in and filling us in with what's happening. And thank you for watching WJTS Inform. Our guest has been District 48 State Senator Mark Mesmer. Thank you for watching. We are WJTS, local people watching local people.